Many things have changed in 50 years. We became stronger, and there are many more of us. We grew. We moved from the countryside to the city. We learned more. We reduced poverty and now live better lives. We had to endure very difficult times. But we persevered and got back on our feet. And there are moments that continue to fill us with joy and achievements that keep making us proud. The history of Latin America is also our history. We are proud of our region. We work every day to improve the quality of life of millions of Latin American citizens. For over 50 years, we have been the Development Bank of Latin America. Let's continue to build a more inclusive and prosperous region. Good morning, everyone. The Honorable Kom Embe, Minister of Finance of the, in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Senator the Honorable Rohan Sinanan, Minister of Works and Transport, the Honorable Calvin Charles, Secretary of the Tobago House of Assembly, Dr. Alvin Halle, Governor of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago, Mr. Antonio Silvera, Vice President of Infrastructure of CAF, Development Bank of Latin America, Mr. Gian Gian Piero Liorsini, representative of CAF in Trinidad and Tobago, members of the Diplomatic Corps of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, specially invited guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. CAF, the Development Bank of Latin America, with the support of the Ministry of Finance of Trinidad and Tobago, gives you a warm welcome to today's seminar entitled Envisioning Long-Term Sustainability for Trinidad and Tobago, Productivity, Innovation, and Resilience in the Framework of CAF's 50th Anniversary. The Development Bank of Latin America is delighted to celebrate 50 years working for sustainable development and regional integration, together with the government and people of Trinidad and Tobago who joined the organization in 1994 and became a full member in 2012. 
Ladies and gentlemen, in recent times, while Trinidad and Tobago has made considerable progress in terms of fiscal consolidation and social inclusion, productivity and climate change have been identified as key challenges. These are complex tasks that require joint efforts to create effective development strategies. Through the seminar today, CAF seeks to facilitate an open dialogue to put forward concrete solutions to improve the quality of lives for our citizens. Today, we invite all our attendees to participate in the CAF's seminar on social networks utilizing the hashtag SustainableCAF and following us on our Twitter account at CAF, Agenda CAF. We also greet the public that follows us by live stream on our website, CAF.com. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed my pleasure to invite to you Mr. Antonio Silvera, the Vice President of Infrastructure of CAP Development Bank, uh, to deliver today's welcome remarks. Let's give him a warm welcome. Good morning, Honorable Colmain Burke, Minister of Finance and Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Honorable Wohan Sinan, Minister of Works and Transport of Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, Honorable Kevin Charles, Chief Secretary of Tobago House of Assembly, Dr. Alvin Hallery, President of the Central Bank of Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago, ambassadors, representatives of international organizations, members of the diplomatic force, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen. You know, uh, this weekend was unique for me, uh, just because my team of the heart, football Flamengo, was twice champion this weekend. First, uh, at the Libertadores de America, challenge and yesterday because of another match we became champions of Brazilian uh, soccer <laughs> league and what is amazing is to wake up on a Monday morning looking at the forest on this amazing hotel it's my first time here usually when we come on mission we stay on the shore area, but this is really amazing, the warm uh, birds cheeping on the window, and really, it's very nice to be here. Pleasure. Um, you know, CAF is celebrating its 50th year of uh, operation in Latin America and Caribbean region. Uh, and it's a pleasure to bring here uh, today for a very deep discussion, members of government, representatives of business, academia, civil society of Trinidad and Tobago, to discuss one of the main uh, challenges for the whole region, how to boost productivity, how to bring prosperity to our peoples. CAF was created by an agreement among governments of Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Venezuela, and began its operations in 1970 with the objective of becoming a financial instrument to support integration of the Indian group. Since then, CAF has broadened its field of action into new sectors, new activities, and gradually expanding its presence across Latin America and Caribbean. Today, CAF is the main multilateral source of funding for infrastructure energy projects in the region with total assets of around 40 billion in a diversified loan portfolio of $27 billion. As a Latin American and Caribbean Development Bank, uh, we are strongly committed to a comprehensive development agenda that seeks to achieve high sustainable and quality growth while fostering social inclusion and promoting cultural diversity and env environmental protection in our 19 member countries. We consider that a close proximity to our clients and a deep knowledge of the region are decisive facts to deliver effective development finance. In this regard, we are very proud of our collaboration with the Twin Island Nation, which is by far the most active member country in the Eastern Caribbean region, 
uh, and the one where we decide to locate our Caribbean office. Mr. Jean-Pierre Orleosini here heads the office with amazing staff that is, of course, we have to commend them to on organizing this important event. In Trinidad Tobago, we have approved uh, in the last three years around 800 million loans, uh, three quarters of which went to support government's fiscal consolidation program and the other 200 million uh, for funding road construction, rehabilitation and maintenance program that is already develop, de delivering impressive results. This year, we have worked in close collaboration with the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Works and Transportation and the Tobago House of Assembly to plan key investments designed to boost tourism and sustainable development, especially in Tobago. First time I've been in Tobago, it was like 2016, and it was really amazing. Uh, after Tuesday, uh, Thursday and Friday working, a weekend in Tobago was really amazing. Boat rides, very good sightseeing. And I really think that organizing ourselves with the government, we can boost tourism, not only in Tobago, but on both islands. And this is a strategy that we want to follow up, especially on this year, 2020, that is incoming. In addition, uh, we have provided a lot of technical assistance uh, in the areas prioritized in government, such as drainage, food prevention, coastal protection, logistics, road information system, financial inclusion, etc. This partnership will continue delivering important results through our joint long-term commitment. Ladies and gentlemen, the success story of CAF has relied to a great extent on its capacity to articulate a vision of development, to define a clear mission, and to have a solid commitment with its member countries, as well as having the ability to mobilize external resources based on its institutional strength. One outstanding feature in the evolution of the major regional development banks is the growth of their intellectual capacity and the research capabilities to assist member countries to produce coherent and effective economic and social policies. CAF also has a well-earned reputation in this area and as a result uh, of applied research on all the countries uh, that participate on the CAF. Each country presents specific challenges, but important lessons can be drawn from experiences of the neighbors. In our daily work, we strive to maximize knowledge, sharing, and we are convinced that events such as this one are decisive on contributing, contributing for this objective. There is no better way of celebrating our anniversary then reflecting together with a distinguished group of specialists upon the challenges that lie ahead to build a more prosperous future for all the countries in the region. We regard, with regard to the topics that we bring, bring us together today, we would like to underline that CAF recognizes the need of development, uh, develop initiative in a more vigorous approach in order to strengthen productivity and enhance resilience to climate change across the region. We therefore see this seminar as a contribution to a national dialogue on challenges of sustainability with hope of building long-term consensus among the key actors that lead to a pact for the productivity, consider a decisive step to achieve sustainable development. We shall hear from our speakers what ingredients are needed to increase productivity and what successful lessons can be drawn from diverse regional experiences. In Latin American and Caribbean, the lack of adequate infrastructure has been identified as one of the main factors limiting economic growth. But this region is particularly vulnerable to the climate change and together with closing infrastructure gap, we must increase the resilience of all the countries regarding to climate change. Our second panel will analyze this issue from the perspective of promoting the blue economy, one that develops, develops full potential of the country coastal and, mat, and 
marine natural capital. Based on, the exper on experience of funding sustainable development and support integration process, CAF is responsive to, to its member countries' needs while being fully aware of the magnitude of the challenge that requires multidimensional collaboration at the region, sub-region, and local levels, as well as between public and private sectors. Latin American and Caribbean, in particular Trinidad and Tobago, can thus count on our determined support to close the productivity gap and foster a blue economy in order to develop a more integrated, sustainable, and inclusive region for its people. Guys, take this chance. It's a very important discussion that we will have here, and I hope you enjoy the whole seminar for this day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Salido. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to invite to the podium a distinguished son of the soil, the Honorable Colm Embe, Minister of Finance of Trinidad and Tobago. On the stage, he will be delivering the keynote speech for today on the subject, Restructuring a Commodity Dependent Economy for Growth Without External Intervention. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give him a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Kizzy. My cabinet colleague, the Honorable Rohan Sinanan, Minister of Works and Transport of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. The Honorable Kelvin Charles, Chief Secretary of the Tobago House of Assembly. Mr. Joel Jack, Deputy Chief Secretary, Tobago House of Assembly, other government ministers. I was looking for my permanent secretary, probably hiding somewhere inside of here hiding in the back. <laughs> Dr. Alvin Hillier, Governor of the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago. Mr. Antonio Silvera, Vice President of Infrastructure of CAF, the Development Bank of Latin America. Other distinguished representatives from CAF, distinguished speakers, members of the media, distinguished guests. My address this morning is slightly different to the theme of the seminar, but I think you will understand my focus when I get to the end of my speech. And before I begin, let me just say it's a great pleasure to be a full member of the Development Bank of Latin America. I really have appreciated the approach of CAF to financing infrastructure uh, policy, fiscal consolidation in, in Trinidad and Tobago. It's been a breath of fresh air when compared to other development banks. For the last 45 years, Trinidad and Tobago's economy has moved up and down in line with commodity prices, particularly oil, gas, and petrochemical prices. The oil crisis of 1973 is particularly relevant. In that year, members of the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries declared an oil embargo aimed at countries perceived as supporting Israel during the Yom Kippur War. This caused a 400% increase in the price of oil. And in less than six months, international oil prices moved from US $3 per barrel to US $12 per barrel, with even higher prices in the United States. This was the first global oil shock, and it caused Trinidad and Tobago's GDP to double in just three years, from US 1.3 billion in 1973 to US 2.6 billion in 1976. The second oil shock occurred in 1979 in the aftermath of the Iranian Revolution, 
and by 1981, the price of oil virtually doubled and hit a high of US $39 a barrel. Our economy followed suit, with Trinidad and Tobago's GDP increasing to US $8 billion by 1982. Then came the collapse in 1985. By 1986, the price of oil had dropped to US $10 a barrel, and our GDP declined in sync to US $4.3 billion. It took us 14 long years, long and difficult years, to get back up to the US 8 billion that we achieved in 1982. In 2003, oil prices began to rebound, hitting a high of US $127 a barrel in 2008. With the coming on stream of the Atlantic LNG plant in Trinidad and Tobago, in the early 2000s, which at the time was the largest liquefied natural gas plant in the world, our economy also shifted from an oil-based economy to a gas-based economy, with natural gas prices also reaching a high of US $13 per MMBTU in 2008. By this time, our GDP had increased to over US $27 billion in 2008 over six times what it was in 1986. I'm pleased to report that in 2019, despite another collapse of oil prices from US $100 a barrel in 2014 to US dollars 26 a barrel in 2016, coupled with a collapse of natural gas prices from U over US $5 per MMBTU in 2014, to less than US $3 in 2019, and a reduction of 90% between 2014 and 2016 in our annual government revenue from petroleum, or loss of US $3 billion per year, equivalent to one third of annual national revenue. Our GDP is still healthy at US $24.4 billion in 2019, with a per capita GDP of over US $18,750. But as you can see, we as a country have always been subject to the vagaries of international commodity prices. This is why the theme of your seminar is so important, improving productivity for long-term sustainability. In the previous energy price collapse of the late 1980s, the then Trinidad and Tobago government chose to engage with the International Monetary Fund in two standby arrangements totaling US $184 million. At the time, they must have felt they had no choice. However, the drastic decline, decline in the price of oil, coupled with an international environment crippled by stagflation, took its toll on our small island state. The one-size-fits-all austerity plan proposed by the IMF at the time and implemented by the then government led to the collapse and downsizing of numerous companies with industries like the automotive, construction, retail, and manufacturing industries suffering tremendously. That economic contraction of the 1980s, which saw our GDP decline by 40%, in just four years was swift and severe, with significant job losses, a high rate of defaults on loans and mortgages, and double-digit unemployment. Stabilization policies by the international agencies also demanded the, the dismantling of our social safety net and welfare programs with a view towards lowering government expenditure. The cost of living allowance was unilaterally removed from public servants, a negative list was introduced for imports, and the dreaded devaluation occurred with the unification of our exchange rate to TT, Trinidad and Tobago, $3.6 to US $1 in 1987, and a further devaluation to Trinidad and Tobago dollars, 4.25 to US $1 in 1988. These adverse effects of the IMF structural adjustment program created the necessity for a wide-ranging program of economic 
and financial reform in Trinidad and Tobago. For the most part, monetary policy was conducted within the framework of a stabilization program whose main focus was on restricting domestic demand and restoring external balance. However, the decline in government expenditure and in real wages created considerable social and economic pressure, especially among the most vulnerable income, income groups in the society. This period of economic austerity also had a profound impact on the fortunes of some non-bank financial institutions. And our central bank suspended the operations of three such institutions, which ran into financial difficulties. Our then central bank governor, William DeMas and his team provided a steadying hand to economic management during those difficult years, in which the central bank, our central bank, implemented a number of tough measures that were geared towards economic stabilization and returning the economy towards a sustainable growth path. By 1991, the economy began to respond to the stabilization measures and to show signs of a recovery. For the next 10 years, from 1991 to 2001, there was slow growth, followed by a tripling of our GDP between 2001 and 2008, as both our energy and non-energy sectors took off as commodity prices skyrocketed. Fast forward now to September 2015 when the present government assumed office. Oil prices were once again dropping like a stone. Gas production was on the decline. Gas prices were depressed, sending our economy into turmoil. That's just four years ago. Over the years, several missions from the International Monetary Fund had conducted their own in-depth review of our economy in their annual Article 4 consultation reports. We reviewed those reports, met with major stakeholder groups upon assuming office, who provided us with their own assessment of the economy, as well as their own solutions. We also benefited from the findings of an IMF technical team who came at our request just after the 2015 election. Many of the proposals from the various interest groups Organizations and experts had a common theme and included implementing a property tax system, expanding the tax base, increasing tax collection, increasing excise taxes known as sin taxes on alcohol and tobacco, increasing personal income tax, increasing corporation tax, eliminating fuel subsidies, reducing or eliminating other subsidies and transfers, introducing wage and hiring restraint mechanisms, reducing the size of the public sector, and finally, reducing government expenditure to match income to the point of achieving a budget surplus. Does any of this sound familiar? Indeed, 25 years after we got ourselves out of an IMF program, we were advised to embrace the same old sterile measures from 1990. Focus on contraction without due consideration of the short and long-term adverse effects on our citizens. However, blind adherence to this severe model of structural adjustment at the expense of our human capital was not a road that we wish to travel again. While understanding the lessons of the past, we focus on our future and carefully reviewed all of these proposals. Some, but not all of them, were found to be appropriate, fair and equitable, and were included in our first fiscal consolidation packages in 2016 and 2017. However, our economy was in an even more perilous state than we, the new, government had initially envisaged. Although our economy was basically flat over the 2010 to 2015 period, with just a 2% overall increase in real GDP over that period, 
the previous government had grown government expenditure to unsustainable levels from TT 46 billion in 2010, or just over US 7 billion, to TT 63 billion in 2014, or US 10 billion, an increase of 37%. Even before the 2015 election, we had reason to believe that our economy had deteriorated significantly. Indeed, several independent commentators, including the international credit rating agencies, were of a similar view. When we were able to establish the reality, we had to balance the need to ensure that the economy had sufficient stimulus for recovery with the need for reducing expenditure and restoring discipline in a medium term fiscal framework. This was particularly difficult in the context of depressed commodity prices. But we chose not to return to the IMF for financial assistance. We had had enough of that. We chose a different path. We immediately embarked on reducing government expenditure to what we felt were manageable levels. From TT 63 billion to TT 52 billion in the first year and eventually down to 50 billion by 2018 is a Trinidad and Tobago dollars. It may sound facetious, but we were able to do this by cutting out waste, mismanagement, and inflated costs, also known in some quarters as corruption. We also chose not to reduce the size of the public service and to pay public sector salaries on time, despite being faced with a huge back pay bill of almost TT 6 billion caused by wage increases granted by the previous government in the election year. We did increase some taxes, notably taxes on wealthy corporations, such as banks, and taxes on imported motor cars. And we increased the royalty rate on oil and natural gas, a measure I will discuss later on. We also decided that it was time to reduce the fuel subsidy which had reached as high as US 1 billion per year, a sum that we could no longer afford as a country. And we thus increased the prices of gasoline at the pump in line with international prices. However, we chose to maintain a significant subsidy on diesel fuel in order to keep the cost of public transportation and the transport of goods at affordable levels. Consistent with our fiscal and monetary policy and against advice from the IMF and local pundits or experts, we also resisted the temptation to drastically devalue the Trinidad and Tobago dollar. We also maintained interest rates at reasonable levels. The purpose of these policies was to suppress inflation and to keep the cost of living down at manageable levels so that the burden of adjustment on our citizens would not be too severe. Our policies have resulted in an annual inflation rate of just 1% in 2019, down from 6% in 2015. We have also managed to maintain eight months of import cover in terms of our foreign ex exchange reserves, despite injecting US $8 billion in foreign exchange into the commercial banking sector over the last four years in order to defend our exchange rate. We also took a long and hard look at those state enterprises that were bleeding the treasury, in particular, our national oil company and our national airline. We found our national oil company to be losing on average US $300 million a year. And our national airline having lost a total of US 500 million over a five year period. We thus set about to address these chronic money losers, lest they crippled our economy. In November, 2018, just about a year ago, we restructured after a lot of thought and research, we restructured our national oil company, shutting down our national 
oil refinery, which was the main source of billion dollar losses over the years, and creating a number of lean, focused, and efficient subsidiaries to deal with oil production and fuel trading. I'm pleased to report that the restructured operations have taken our national oil company from an annual loss of US 300 million to a profit before tax of US 100 million a year in just one year. And while doing this, we were also able to successfully refinance without a sovereign guarantee, a US 850 million bond taken out by the company 12 years ago that became due for payment in August of 2019 this year. With respect to our national airline, we changed the management and re-engineered the business processes at the company for optimum efficiency, moving the company in just three years from losing on average US 100 million a year into profitability with net income projected at US 20 million in 2019. These are just some examples of the fiscal measures we took to increase revenue and reduce expenditure, but we did it our way. If we had sought international assistance from the lender of last resort, there was little doubt we would have been forced to cut expenditure to the point that there would have been mass retrenchment in the public sector, the cost of electricity and water would have increased significantly, Free education, which the Trinidad and Tobago government pays for up to the tertiary level, and free healthcare would have disappeared, and our social safety net would have been severely damaged. We would also have been forced to devalue our currency in order to achieve the 6% budget surplus that appears to be the fate or flavor of the month of those countries forced into standby arrangements with the IMF. Allow me now to speak about the structure of our economy. Governments of commodity-based economies are always urged to diversify their economies in order to be able to better manage price shocks. But that is easier said than done. It is not easy to diversify an economy that for over 45 years has derived a substantial part of its income from oil, gas, and gas-based industries. No disrespect to the advocates of diversification, and no disrespect to my esteemed colleague, but buzzwords like the blue economy, the green economy, and the silver economy sound nice, but these transformations cannot be achieved overnight. Notwithstanding this fact, the economy of Trinidad and Tobago is in fact changing. In 2019, the mining sector and the petroleum and chemical product sector, which are essentially the core areas of our energy sector, make up just 28% of our economy. The other 72% is made up of the non-oil manufacturing and a range of non-oil services, which has helped us to weather the storm created by the collapse of oil prices in 2014. However, 11 years ago in 2008, the petroleum sector made up 50% of our economy. So there has been a significant shift away over the years from absolute dependence on oil and gas, but it is still our engine of growth. Recognizing this in Washington back in 2016, we asked the IMF to provide us with technical assistance with respect to the reform of our oil and gas fiscal regime. They obliged at no cost to Trinidad and Tobago and advised us that oil and gas fiscal regimes should always seek to incorporate a balance among objectives. Accordingly, while governments should seek to promote investment by reducing the fiscal burden on energy sector projects of low profitability, they should also seek to assure the public that extraction of the country's natural resources all of its results in some minimum payment, such as an appropriate royalty. In addition, where a petroleum project generates a significant surplus over the initial outlay and the cost of production and continuing investment, the government and by extension the population 
should share substantially in that surplus. This underscores the justification for a supplemental petroleum tax when oil prices are high. Fortuitously, while in opposition, in the 2010 to 2015 period, I decided to go back to school. And just before the 2015 election, I completed a master's degree in oil and gas law at the Aberdeen Business School. My dissertation by happy coincidence involved an examination of an appropriate fiscal regime for an energy dependent economy in a period of low oil prices. What a coincidence. In my studies, I never knew when I started that in 2012, what would happen to oil prices. In my studies, I had looked at a number of oil producing countries, in particular Russia, and I'd taken note of the fact that over the years, as oil prices fluctuated, Russia had insisted on maintaining a royalty regime or a volume-based tax for its oil and gas sector, as opposed to a profits-based tax. It had done so in order to ensure that whatever the price of oil and gas, it would always earn income from its hydrocarbon reserves. By contrast, in Trinidad and Tobago, because, of the because the focus was on a profit-based tax, the new government in 2015 was faced with the prospect of earning no revenue from the energy sector at all for up to nine years. One major oil company actually told us that they would pay no petroleum profits tax until 2024. So when the IMF technical team recommended in 2016 that we review our oil and gas royalty regime, it was consistent with what I knew to be correct. And in short order, we introduced a wide ranging royalty of 12.5% on all oil and gas production in Trinidad and Tobago, that is the subject of exploration and production licenses. In addition, we set about arresting the decline in oil and gas production, utilizing an empowered team of government ministers and energy sector experts to negotiate more equitable terms and conditions for the production of oil and gas by the major upstream energy companies and to create the conditions for enhanced oil and gas production and a greater share of energy sector revenue for the country. Our very own Honorable Prime Minister himself led some of these negotiations in the various energy capitals of the world. The net result of these initiatives is a doubling of our energy sector revenues between 2016 and 2019, from TT 7 billion in 2016 to TT 14 billion in 2019. Together with the stabilization of oil production and a 20% increase in natural gas production over the last three years, coupled with an increase in our gas reserves proven probable and possible. We are also now on the threshold of sustainable growth for the future, as we move towards our objective of a balanced national budget in the medium term. In 2019, because of our fiscal discipline and our revenue generating measures, we have been able to narrow our fiscal deficit to just over 2% of GDP, a far cry from the difficulties we faced in 2016, when oil hit the low of $26 a barrel. We have also stabilized our debt to GDP ratio at 62% for the last two years. Going forward, and this is consistent with your theme, our national development agenda will build on our achievements as we continue to take the necessary measures to avoid a debt trap and external intervention. In the context of the theme of this CAF seminar, we intend to focus on expanding exports, and increasing foreign exchange earnings and employment, suppressing crime, reversing non-progressive values, attitudes and behaviors, such as low productivity and poor work ethos, undertaking constitutional and institutional reform, addressing the impact of shale gas on our market, discouraging the culture of irresponsibility and dampening unreasonable expectations, 
ensuring effective and efficient public service delivery and implementation of development interventions and measurement of results, transforming the existing economic growth model into one that is environmentally friendly while addressing climate change, including reducing greenhouse gas emissions, protecting and sustaining using our environmental resources. These are essential attributes of our development strategy. And we are already witnessing some benefits from the sustained interactive process of development. On this foundation, the economy is being rebalanced with revenue and expenditure levels significantly lower than they were in 2015 and strengthened with appropriate reforms and policies. This has resulted in our unemployment rate remaining at low levels, less than 5% thus maintaining social and economic stability and inclusiveness. And so as I conclude, if I may be so bold, what is the lesson for other energy dependent countries or economies faced with similar challenges? That is a collapse in commodity prices. The answer in my view is the following. While adjusting to a recession, strive to maintain social peace and a decent standard of living for your citizens. Be moderate and gradual in the reduction of subsidies. Stimulate economic growth while maintaining social equity in the country, by which I mean do not ignore or de-emphasize your energy sector. Avoid cost overruns, reckless or unnecessary spending. Maximize the revenue potential of your natural resources. Maintain a social safety net. Avoid inflation and devaluation. Ensure that you get the best deal possible from the multinational oil and gas companies. And at all costs, stay away from IMF standby arrangements. I thank you.